I'm Jeff Chomet. I work at Adobe right here in Seattle. I really enjoy functional programming, and I also like to do game dev. And today, I'm going to talk to you about behavior trees. What do this iconic video game enemy, these adorable little robots, and automated drones like this one all have in common? The answer is they all have AIs powered by behavior trees. Now, when I tell people about behavior trees, most of the time, they've never heard of them before. And I think behavior trees are a really fun and interesting pattern, so I'm excited to share them with you. I'm going to start off by going through what a behavior tree is, how it works, why you might use it. Then we're going to look at how to implement one, especially in a language like Elixir. And at the end, I have a fun demo where we will iteratively build up our own AI. So you're all familiar with trees. A behavior tree is just a tree that has some specialized nodes. And the first type of special node is the leaves. The leaves of a tree are the actual behaviors or actions that this AI can do. And so up here, I have the leaves in yellow. And there's going to be some corresponding code that knows how to do what each of these different behaviors are. And the behavior tree is always going to have one of these actions active at any given time. And that can either fail or succeed. And when that happens, it'll move on to another leaf, another behavior. And then that will run. That's the idea. But this isn't uh, uh, too interesting yet. The other kind of node are the internal nodes. Those are called control nodes, and they describe how you move through the tree from one leaf to another. This is one type of control node, one of the common types called a selector. And the way a selector works is it runs its first child, and if that child fails, then it will try the next one. And if that fails, it'll try the next one. And it just keeps going until it reaches a child that succeeds and then the whole selector will succeed. If it runs through all of its children and none of them succeed, if they all fail, then the selector node fails. So in this very simple tree, it will start out. This is like a behavior tree for a little RPG character. It'll start off with the first child, which is fight enemy. And if that fails, then it'll move on to do side quest. Uh, if that succeeds, then this whole thing will succeed and it starts over again. Uh, but just one layer like this is very simple. So the interesting thing, thing happens when you build up more. This is a new kind of control node. So this is called a sequence. And it's basically the inverse of a selector. It starts with its first child. And if that succeeds, it moves on to the next one. And if that succeeds, it keeps moving on until all the children have succeeded and then it will succeed. If any of a sequence children fails, then the whole sequence fails. And so I'll just walk through how this would work. Uh, it starts, it moves down to the first child. So in this case, it would be choose enemy. And let's say that there are no enemies in sight. So choose enemy would fail because a sequence is known. Uh, if any children fail, the sequence fails. The sequence would fail, and the selector would move on to its next child, which is do side quest. But if choose enemy succeeded, it would move on to approach enemy. And if that succeeds, it would move on to fight. And if that succeeds, then the whole thing uh, succeeds, and it starts again. And so you can see, by just building up this tree and adding more and more structure and more control nodes, how you can build up some interesting behaviors and some rather complex behaviors that are described purely by the shape of the tree. Where do you see behavior trees? They're used very commonly in video games. They're also used in robotics. And the part that I think is of most interest to everyone here today is you can use them for bots, like chatbots, uh, or for automation. In fact, the reason that I started looking at behavior trees in Elixir in the first place was that my colleagues and I wanted to do some automated testing, and we wanted to hit our API in ways that would emulate real users. 
And so we thought of building up behavior trees to, to approximate that. Some of the reasons that uh, people like to use behavior trees, one of them is that it's just data, and data is simple. Uh, it's objective. We know what trees are and how they work. There's only so many things you can do with it. So nice and simple. It's also declarative, which means you can look at how the tree has been defined and kind of tell what's going to happen. You don't have to wait till runtime to debug it. But another nice thing is that it is serializable, which means it's possible to have a visual editor where you can build out your tree and then import it into your code. This is an example of a plugin for the popular Unity game engine. And it allows you to visually build up some very interesting and complex behavior trees without even writing a single load line of code. The other big reason that people like behavior trees is scalability. This is a huge behavior tree. And it might look complex when you first look at it. But the thing about trees is a whole tree is just made up of subtrees. And those subtrees are made up of other subtrees all the way down. And so you can just look at one of these subtrees and just isolate that and focus on that and make your changes. Uh, and that's ni nice to simplify. Or if you want to add more behavior, you just replace one of these nodes with a new subtree. Or you could even take this whole tree and just put that whole thing in an existing larger tree to make something even bigger. So it's this composability of trees that make the behavior tree very powerful. Now that you know basically the idea behind behavior trees, let's talk about how we would build one. So there's a little bit of hand waving here. But the idea is each node in a behavior tree has a state. And you start by walking through the whole tree and set everything to ready. Then you begin at the top, and you work your way down to a leaf. And as you're moving through each node, you set it to a running state. And when you reach a leaf, you run it. It goes off and does whatever it's going to do. Meanwhile, you go back up to the top of the tree and work your way down again, following the path of running nodes. And you keep doing that 60 times a second. And at some point, the leaf is going to fail or succeed. And when it does, it sets its state back to, or from running to either failed or succeeded. And as you're going through this tree, you'll hit it and see, oh, if it's failed or succeeded, you stop and you move on to the next node based on the control nodes. And as you're going up, you set all the nodes back to ready. And as you're going down, you set them all back to running. But wait a minute. I talked about side effects and mutation and these life cycles. That sounds like OOP. And it makes sense, because these come from, like I said, games and robotics where you're using Java and C. So that's the paradigm. But we can't do that in Elixir. So how do we do this? I tried to do this basic pattern in a functional style, which involved threading a lot of state through this mechanics of recursively walking a tree. And it worked, but it was messy and confusing. And it just mixed the like, business logic with the mechanics. It was hard to work with. And then I learned about zipper trees. How many people here are familiar with zipper trees? Cool, not very many people. Well, I'm going to take a digression and talk about advanced data structures. Now, when I say advanced data structures, uh, I mean a st something that's built for a specific purpose that relies on primitives like lists and trees. Uh, and the important part is it gets its functionality not from code and logic, but rather from the shape and structure of its, its data. And the example that I'll use is a zipper. There's a couple kinds of zippers. There's a zipper list and a zipper tree. They both work very similar. Uh, one works in one dimension, and the other works in two dimensions. So conceptually, the idea is imagine a whole tree. And now instead of thinking of it as many different nodes, just focus on one node anywhere in the tree. And just place your focus there and kind of ignore everything around it. And if you do that, you can kind of treat this whole tree as a single value. And imagine you have a way of passing this whole thing around so that you can keep what that focus is. 
but there's also an API that will let you move from wherever you're focused. You can maybe move to the child to the left or move up or down or to the right, and then you can pass that new focused version of the tree around. That's the idea of a zipper. And so this is what it looks like in code. Uh, we take a regular list, turn it into a zipper list, and then you can just move to the right, you can move to the left, you can change whatever's focused and see what that value is that you're focused on. It's very simple and elegant, and it says exactly what you want to do. There's no mechanics here. You're not keeping track of an index and the length of the list and all that type of stuff. Uh, you're just saying what you want to happen. So it's nice to work with as a client, but what does it look like in its internals? This is the, the magic data structure of a zipper. So you keep track of what your focus is, and then all you need to do is have a list of everything to the left of your focus and everything to the right of your focus. And if you want to move to the right, you just put your focus in the list that's to the left of you, and you take the head of whatever's to the right of you and move that into your new focus. And you can just move right and left in that manner. And if you try to move to the right and there is nothing to the right of you, it's an empty list, then you know you can't go there. And so it's very clean and simple. There's no logic. You're just looking at data to figure out how to get this behavior. And that's kind of the idea. And I just want to point out that it works for trees as well. Same thing, although you can move up and down. And you're going to have to keep track of more than just right and left, uh, but the same basic idea. So now that we are familiar with a zipper tree, let's take another look at how we would build a behavior tree in Elixir. And we'll base it on the zipper tree. So the first thing we'll do is throw out the concept of life cycles. We don't need running and ready and all that. Uh, because if we rely on a zipper tree, then we have a focus node. And so if we just make sure that we are always focused on one of the leaves, one of the actions, then that is the active running node. Uh, and we don't need to run through the tree from the top to bottom anymore. We just pass this tree around. Uh, we can do the behavior. And then at some point, we have to say, hey, that failed or that succeeded. And we need to make sure that we move the focus to the new, whatever the next behavior is. Uh, but again, that is the new active node. So that like conceptually makes sense. Uh, there is a little bit of a trade-off. Because we're not running through this over and over again, we lose some of the concurrency constructs that you have. There's two nodes in behavior trees that allow for this. There's a parallel node, which will run all of its children at the same time. And then if any of them fail, it fails, or the inverse of that. And there's also a thing called an, a priority node, which it'll run its child. But each time you run through the tree, it will look at nodes that have a higher priority. And if any of them needs to be dealt with, it cancels whatever's running and switches to that higher priority node. Um, so we can't really do that because, by definition, there's a focused node of this tree. Uh, so we miss out on those. But I think in the context of Elixir and where you would use Elixir, we don't really need the idea of a game loop. So I think that is an OK trade-off. Let's look at what some code might look like to use it with this new approach. So the first thing that we would need is a way to construct this tree. Uh, and there's just some simple constructors to make these different kinds of nodes. You can see the select and the sequence node that I pointed out before. And they just take a list of children. And you can nest them to build up a tree. And it looks like the insert. One thing that I want to um, point out is that I'm using atoms as the leaves here. I think that works rather well. I kind of picture the tree as just spitting out these messages of like, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to do. And there's going to be some handler code somewhere else that is listening to those and pattern matching on them to go do whatever it has to do. And so that's a nice Elixir pattern, message passing and pattern matching. It works well, uh, although there might be some scalability issues with it. Because if you want to add some more leaves, you need to change your handler to match against them. Uh, so 
you could actually use whatever you want. It's polymorphic leaves here, and so you don't need to use atoms. You could, for example, use a function that just took some state and returned the new state, and maybe also if it failed or succeeded. Or you could call a process, or you could even use a task, and that would make the leaves more contained uh, and possibly more scalable. But the leaves can be whatever you want, so uh, you're free to do whatever you need. OK, back to this. So now we have a data structure, but it's not stateful yet. So the first thing we have to do is start the tree. And we need to somehow descend to the proper leaf, and we'll look at that in a moment. Uh, but as soon as we call start on this, it is now a zipper with a focus. And then we need to have a way of saying that worked. So we tell it it succeeded, and it will move to the next node. And again, we'll look at exactly how that happens. And then we also want to be able to say that it failed, and uh, it should move to the right node. And then we want to be able to see what the current focused action is, so we can just look at that. That's the idea for the API of this behavior tree. And you can see that it's very simple. It's saying what you want to do, not how you want to do it. Uh, and it's all in the terms of your domain, kind of the business logic. So how do we implement that? I'm going to skip over the part that has these four functions on it, because that's just a thin wrapper that delegates to the nodes. And the nodes is where the interesting stuff happens. So I'm going to move to that. Now, the nodes all work in about the same way. And so we can make a protocol that defines what you need to implement a node. And the nice thing about this is we could build a, a bunch of nodes out. But if someone needs to have a custom node, then they just have to implement this protocol. They don't have to fork the library or anything like that. So protocol is nice for this. It's also nice just to build out the standard set of nodes. Uh, all we have to do is implement a couple functions. And so I'll walk through them. The first one is start. And so start is uh, when, when you enter this node and begin it, you have to sort of descend and get to a leaf. And so for most types of nodes, you just go to the first child. And we're passed in the zipper, which is focused like beginning at the top. And as we move down, we just move that focus down. And in most cases, it's just zipper down to just keep moving. And as we uh, return that newly focused tree, the wrapper code will just call start on that again. And it just keeps calling start until we're at a leaf. And then it's done. Some other nodes, like maybe a random type of node, wouldn't do down. It would shuffle it first or something like that before moving down. But most of them just go down. On fail and on succeed is really the meat of this. Uh, so those are, there's just one thing to understand about those. Uh, because it's the parent of the focus node that determines how you move through the tree, uh, we pass in the parent as the first parameter and then the focused tree as the second parameter. And so, the code that you see on the screen right now is all the code that it takes to implement the sequence node. And it's not very much. And so if we're on a leaf, and the leaf is inside of a sequence node, and we call on fail on that outer wrapper, it'll delegate that to uh, calling it with the parent of the focus, which if it's a sequence, then it will hit this implementation for it. And so on fail, like I mentioned for a sequence, if any of the children fail, then the whole sequence node fails. And so we just have to return this magic atom, fail. And the wrapper knows that if it gets that, it just moves the focus of the tree up to the parent and then calls on fail on that. On succeed works very much the same way. For a sequence node, if it succeeded, you just move to the next child. And so we say zipper.write, which moves the focus to the right. Now, if there's no more children to the right of it, it means that all the children have succeeded. And so that means that the entire uh, sequence node should succeed. And so again, we have a magic atom succeed, which works the same way that fail did. It just moves the focus up to the parent and calls on succeed there. If we can move to the right, then we shift that focus 
and return that newly focused tree and the wrapper around it will call start on that to descend to the next leaf. And that's all there is to it. Uh, I think you would agree that it's pretty simple and it's all in the language of our business logic. There's practically no mechanics and implementation here once you understand how Zipper works. And I bet that any one of you could very easily implement the protocol for the select node. And you could probably implement your own custom node without too much trouble. And by the way, this is exactly how I approach building this library, which is up on hex. So if you want to look closer at the code or even play with it, feel free to give it a shot. And now, it's demo time. I wanted to make a demo that would showcase a behavior tree in action. And so the idea that I had was an AI that can play the game Battleship. You all know Battleship. It's the game where you have a grid, you put ships on it, and then you try to guess where the ships are and sink them all. A basic strategy for this game would be to begin by randomly guessing, and then if you uh, hit a ship, you have to figure out its orientation. And when you know the orientation, you just move in one direction, and either you'll sink it, or if you miss, you move in the other direction until you've completely sunk it. And then you start over again. So that's exactly what we will build a behavior tree to do. This is the beginning of that. It's very simple right now. It just knows two things, sinking, and destroying. Now let's develop this behavior tree a little bit further. We're going to, sinking, we'll just make that a random guess. And the destroy part of this will add some more uh, complexity to it. And so this set of nested selectors will begin on the path that goes to the tree that has right left. And if right fails, then it'll try left, and if left fails, then it'll go all the way up and down to up, and so it knows, oh, it's not horizontal. But if right succeeds, then it knows it's horizontal, so it'll move right until it fails, and then it will try left, or if it succeeds, then, then that's it. So that's the tree to accomplish this. This is what that looks like in code, using those constructors that we had before. And there's going to be some other code that keeps track of the size of the board and which ones have already been guessed and where we're targeted. But this is the code that updates the tree. And so if we're in the seeking mode, we, if we are seeking and we miss, then you want to just keep doing these random guesses. And so we just don't change the tree. If we're doing random guesses and we get a hit, then we want to succeed so that it will move into that destroy part of the tree. And if we sink it, if we happen to sink a ship, then we just keep going with random guessing. If we're in the destroy branch of this tree, and this works for any of the directions, if we miss, then that direction just isn't working, so we have to fail the tree. If we get a hit, then that means that direction is working, so keep going. And if we sink it, then we've succeeded. And it will start over again from the beginning. That's the code, and I have a demo for you. Now, I've built a application. It's an OTP application that has this AI and some a, a thing that knows about how to run a board and make guesses on it. Uh, and I have the tree up here. This is running locally. And I have a client that just lets us visually see this play out. So the back end doesn't know where the ships are. But it's going to use that tree that we just looked at and try to guess it all. As soon as I hit play, I want you to look for two things. I want you to first see how it begins randomly guessing, and then notice that as soon as it gets a hit, it'll start going to that destroy phase. And the second thing to look for is to notice how it always goes to the right, and then to the left, and then up, and then down. Ready? So this is all random. It got a hit and it went right, left, up, down. 
the same thing. And then once again, there it is. Our behavior tree has played Battleship. Thank you. So that was fun, but our play testers noticed a couple of issues. The first thing they noticed is because it always goes right, left, up, down, they realized that they could kind of game the system. And by putting ships like this, it's always going to have a maximum of three extra hits as it tries to narrow it down. Uh, and so we don't want that. We don't want people to be able to predict the tree. So we have to account for that. And how would we do that? So one way uh, would be just to add some element of randomness. That's what the percent node here is, a random child. And so a, uh, this uh, would just choose one of these directions randomly. And that doesn't quite work, because we don't want it to just go in random directions. Once it's figured out the orientation and the direction, we want it to keep track of that. We just want it to randomly uh, randomize which way it tries first which means we have to hold on to some state somewhere of what direction we've chosen. And there's a few places that we could put this. We could just put it in the code, but we're trying to demonstrate this with the behavior tree, so let's not do it that way. Another solution that would work really well is to make our own custom node, like something like a persistent randomizer or uh, something like that, where it, when it starts, shuffles all of its children, and then it just works like a normal selector. That would work just fine, and it kind of shows how you can do some pretty interesting things in a custom node, even changing the shape of the tree at runtime, which is pretty powerful. Um, but I want to show you that we can also solve this purely by changing the shape of the data structure and not changing any code. So this is that destroy side of the tree. And it looks a little complex, so I've just drawn some boxes around it. Essentially, I've just inserted this randomizer node in between each of the uh, selector layers. So the very top is going to randomly choose between either trying vertical first or horizontal first. And once it's gone down that path, then it goes into the selector as before. And the same thing happens when it tries left first or right first, and same with up and down. It looks kind of confusing, but uh, it's not terrible with just these four different states that we have to permutate. And the code for it looks even better because we can give a name to these subtrees and then just reuse it uh, like we are here with check horizontal and check vertical. So pretty manageable. And that should solve the predictability problem. There's another problem. If you put ships that are touching, then uh, it'll go through and sink a ship and kind of forget that it had hit some other ships around it while it was trying to narrow down. And you end up with moving on to random guessing when it could just optimize by knowing that it's found some other ships already and going through those before it goes back to random guessing. So we can deal with that as well we need to develop the tree a little bit further. And I've got some new nodes on this tree, so I'll walk through it. It starts off the same as before, the random guessing. Check adjacent is that whole random tree that I had showed you a minute ago. And then this new node is called a repeat until fail. And so inside of that, we have a sequence which begins with check for collateral damage. Now, we need to add a little bit more code here as we're hit, getting hits, we need to keep track of all the hits that we get. And then if we get a sunk, we need to know how large the ship is so that we can tell if there were any hits left over. And that's what we're going to check for collateral damage. Um, so if there is no collateral damage, then this will fail. And because it's in a sequence, the sequence will fail. And because that's in a repeat until fail, that will actually succeed, and the whole tree will start over again. If there is collateral damage, it'll move on to the next node, and the check mark means always succeed, and its child is check adjacent, which is that same node that just we've looked at before a few times. 
uh, and that will narrow down on wherever the, the collateral damage is. And then, because it's in a repeat, it will go back through this tree with check for collateral damage. And it'll keep doing that. The reason we use always succeed is we only want to escape from this loop if check for collateral damage fails. And so we ensure that by using always succeed. So you can see how by working these different control nodes against each other, you can build up some pretty complex behavior. That's all we need to solve these two problems in our tree. And so I'm going to show you one more time new and improved version of our AI. I'm just going to change. Oops, not there. So right now, I'm hot reloading the AI to use the new tree. And I have a new board. You can see this one has a lot of touching ships. So as I run this, keep a lookout for the cases where, like in that case, it happened to go right and then left first. But in this case, it went left first. And you should see it sometimes going up and down instead. So we've randomized the way it goes. And the other thing, like right here, it's got hits in multiple ships. And you'll see that it's going to sync all those ships before it moves on to randomizing again. I think you get the idea. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, this is the code uh, for that tree, making use of the, uh, the randomized version of it. Uh, and so that's it. I hope that you, uh, now that you know about behavior trees, you agree with me that they're fun and cool. And you might even find a place that they could help you out in one of your projects. But most importantly, I hope you take away the idea of using data structures instead of code to uh, add some elegance and simplicity to your projects. And I have some links here to, if you want to go look at the hex package that I put up or play the game yourself, you can uh, feel free to. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I think we have some time for questions, yeah. so fire away. Have you implemented this behavior tree package in a project in production or seen that done? It, and did you make it? Yeah. I made the behavior tree library that I showed you on Hex. And this battleship guesser is the only thing I've used it for right now, mostly as a proof of concept and something to show it. Uh, so it hasn't been used outside of that that I'm aware. And only 60 people have downloaded it, so probably it hasn't been. But um, we might use it, as I was saying, for doing some automated testing. Um, but it hasn't yet. So if you end up doing that, definitely let me know. Post some issues or something if you run into anything. And I hope that it can be used. Uh, this is, yeah, hey. <laughs> um, <Where are they? laughs> uh, so this is a really new thing for me to learn right now. So. This is a really great talk. Thank you. Thanks. I'm curious um, if there's a way to use this to maybe uh, explore very deep data structures. Uh, interesting question. I haven't thought of it in that term before, but you might be able to. If, it, if there's this idea of trying out a tactic and then that might fail or succeed and switching to a new tactic, uh, then this would certainly help with that. Uh, you, the alternatives are a bunch of if statements or a state machine. And so the benefits I mentioned about scalability and uh, just simple, simple data is why you might use this instead of another approach. So if you have enough reason to do this, then you probably could. But it might not be necessary to do that. Do you want to go? Okay. Any other questions? I don't think so. All right. Thanks again, everyone.